from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, K-State's Kelsey Anderson will report that southern rust disease has been confirmed in Kansas corn. She'll talk about the potential spread of that rust and managing it if it does turn up in one's corn stands. Following then, K-State's Jeff Whitworth with the latest update on insects feeding on corn, grain sorghum, and soybean stands in the state. Specifically, he addresses rootworms and beetles feeding on corn silks, caterpillars working on sorghum whorls, and false chinch bugs in sorghum and soybeans. And later, K-State's Charlie Lee discussing this week the common reasons why farm ponds leak and the practicality of fixing those leaks. All that and more here on Agriculture Today. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. We're glad to have you tuned in once again for this Agriculture Today on the K-State Radio Network. First up for you, word on a disease issue that has shown up and been confirmed in Kansas corn. We want to explore just how serious this could be and whether you growers should respond to it and how. We're talking about southern rust disease in corn, and joining us is Kelsey Anderson. Kelsey is a research and extension plant pathologist at K-State. Normally, she focuses her energies on wheat diseases, but she is helping out with information on row crop diseases as well. Thank you, Kelsey, for allowing us a few moments. And what about southern rust disease? It has been, you say, discovered in part of Kansas. What is the story to date? Yeah, good morning, Eric. Thanks for having me. So so Southern Rust, I guess the big story in corn right now, it's been uh, observed in eastern Kansas already. So kind of southeast Kansas. Um, it's been confirmed here in Riley County. So uh, we were out scouting and found Southern Rust here in Riley County. So we believe it, it's moving west. And then it's also been confirmed in, in northeast Kansas. So it's definitely out there. It's come in earlier than it has in some years, although around the same time it did last year. And so this is the time when um, producers are going to want to think about and be scouting uh, and making the decision about applying a fungicide. What is southern rust? Yeah, yeah. So southern rust is a fungal disease. It's pretty characteristic. It's pretty obvious. You can see it on the, the top of the leaf. Typically, if you flip the leaf over, instead of seeing rust spores, you'll just see um, little yellow or chlorotic spots. So on that top side of the leaf, you can see little pustules. So it's it's a fungus that'll pretty much break through the top of the, the corn leaf. And if you rub your finger on it or you open up those pustules, you'll basically see a lot of orange spores on your hand. And, and that's one of the ways you can diagnose southern rust. Southern rust um, could potentially be confused with common rust. So that's another disease that's less damaging to corn. And that one sometimes has longer pustules, darker spores. Um, It can be found on both sides of the leaf. So that's one you want to differentiate between. Is this southern rust or is this common rust? And then you can make your decision about what to do next. And in as far as that damage that southern rust can inflict on corn, to what extent? How does that manifest itself, that damage? Sure, yeah. So those spores can blow in. And after several days, you'll start to see the new spores develop. And particularly when we have hot weather, which we've been having. So Southern Rust really likes hot weather. And it also likes humidity. So we've also been having that. So these conditions have been really good. And after you start to see symptoms, the um, Southern Rust pathogen will produce more spores. So in maybe seven to nine days, You'll see um, newly infected plants, and you can also start to see disease up into the the higher leaves of the plant, like the ear leaf. And that's when we start to get 
concerned about about yield loss. So it can spread really rapidly once it arrives. And that's one of the reasons why we have to watch southern rust really carefully. Is the timing of that arrival of southern rust, Kelsey, important to the extent of damage? That is to say, the stage of plant development, uh, does that make a difference in as far as rust's impact? Yeah, absolutely. So we wanted to stay away as long as possible. (laughs) We're in a little bit of a race against southern rust here in Kansas. So the earlier it arrives, the more likelihood that there'll be corn in the field that's in a growth stage that's susceptible. So if it's really, if it's before R3, if it's before that milk stage, we can see yield damage if southern rust gets bad enough. So this is a problem in anything that's any corn that's basically before that milk stage or in late planting corn. So that would be probably even close to tasseling at this point. And that's when you really do have um, the chance of, of a yield loss. So that's, that's the corn that you want to consider managing. Conversely, if a corn stand is further along, it's in the silking stage or even further, it might be less susceptible to southern rust. Yep. If you're in dough, R4, or you're moving into dent, um, you're probably safe. You've probably kind of outrun that yield loss that you can get from southern rust. And, and that's when fungicides would become um, much less effective to control this disease. Yeah. Well, let's address that topic of treatment against southern rust. First of all, can one put on a preventative fungicide to put up a shield, if you will, against southern rust's potential arrival? So I would be careful about that because, um, especially with the cost of of foliar fungicide applications and the length of the season, it's usually best to apply a fungicide when you've already seen the pathogen in your cornfield and it's above a certain level. So maybe 25 to 50 percent of the plants have symptoms and it's starting to move into the upper canopy. That's when you're going to see the highest impact of a fungicide application. One of the problems with applying too early, so if you do apply a fungicide at maybe tasseling or before, you can actually run out of life of that fungicide before southern rust becomes a big problem. So most foliar fungicides only have a residual activity of up to three weeks. So they'll only last three weeks, and then you'll start to see symptoms again. So you can get some some tail end yield loss. So it's it's important to maximize your application timing by applying when you start to see those symptoms and they're starting to get a little bit worse. So, so that would be the optimal time. You know, it's hard to time exactly right. Um, so there's some wiggle room, but, but yeah, that's usually what is recommended. And in as far as fungicide products, do we see efficacy generally the same across the spectrum of products? Yeah, so there are a range of products that are recommended and that are labeled. We always recommend using products that are labeled for Southern Rest. And there are several that are good to to excellent for Southern Rest control. So there is some variation. So it's important to look at that that information. And the Corn Working Group has put together a nice table that you can find on cropprotectionnetwork.org that goes through each of those fungicides and, and kind of if they're good or if they're excellent or if they're not labeled. So that's a really fantastic resource. So that that is something to consider. So fungicides do have different properties and some can be better than others. The other thing to consider is that if you did make an application for another disease like gray leaf spot and that disease that was within that window, maybe around tasseling or just after, most of those products, and again, it's important to check the label, but most of those products will be good or very good to control southern rust. So that's that's an important consideration when it comes to choosing a fungicide. As always, though, Kelsey, it's a judgment call as to whether one wants to treat any disease. And, of course, in this case, southern rust can take quite a toll. So each individual will have to weigh all of this for themselves. But you think it's a serious enough threat that producers need to be serious about it? I would be watching it. If you've found southern rust or if you're scouting right now and you're before R3, if you're before milk, it's really something to keep an eye on because this is one, again, that can pick up fast. A couple other things to think about. The temperatures are going to be really high. Relative humidity is going to be in the right range. So that is one thing that's um, going to be important to watch that could kick it off. And also, 
just make sure you check your hybrid genetics because there are some hybrids, um, although very few, that have resistance to southern rust. And so if you do have a hybrid that is resistant or, or moderately resistant to southern rust, that would not be the hybrid I would spray a fungicide on right. because, because you really do have protection. You're not going to see that pathogen take off at all in those more resistant hybrids. So that that's just another thing to think about. And there is a very fine informational publication out of K-State on identifying rust diseases broadly. And you mentioned identification is key, distinguishing southern rust from common rust. So folks might want to reference that. Sure. Yeah, I think so. I think those are the two that that probably get confused the most. And common rust is probably, like its name says, more common and less of a, a problem for yield loss. You know, there are a couple diagnostic things to look at. The common rust pathogen usually has longer lesions. They're more blocky. The spores are a little bit darker. They're usually on the underside of the leaf as well, as opposed to southern rust, which is a lighter orange and on the top side of the leaf. But when in doubt, we do have a plant diagnostic clinic here at K-State, and um, that's a pretty simple test to run. So we can just quickly look at those spores under the microscope, and we can tell you one way or the other. So so just keep in mind that that's always a resource, or you can send us an email or, or give us a call, and, and we can help out with that. You bet. Producers, don't forget that if you have any uncertainty at all about what's going on rust-wise in your corn, take full advantage of the Plant Disease Diagnostic Laboratory here at K-State. As well, look for the publication on the K-State Research and Extension website, Corn Rust Identification and Management in Kansas, as Southern Rust, once more, has arrived in the state. Kelsey, thanks for this. We will have you back soon to talk about those fresh off the press Kansas wheat disease and insect ratings you're working on now. Looking forward to talking about those findings here in the coming days with you. Until then, many thanks. Great. Thanks for having me. That's the update on southern rust disease in corn from Kelsey Anderson, plant pathologist, K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today is back in a moment on the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. We're back now on Agriculture Today, and as you might expect, there is a host of insect activity out there in our row crops currently. To catch you up on the latest on that front and how you as growers might respond, Jeff Whitworth is Mike's side once more, crop entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. A little something for our corn and sorghum growers for sure here, Jeff, maybe with time, something about uh, bean insects as well, but you are hearing from producers about silk feeding in corn, and you say this is the work of the rootworm, quite likely. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Yep. Uh, yes, it's that time of year. A lot of the field corn is pollinating, silking uh, at that stage, at least. In our rootworm plots in central Kansas, again, most of the root feeding by the corn rootworm, in this case western corn rootworm, is completed or, or really close to being completed. And so the adult rootworms have been emerging. Oh, we've picked up our first ones in the the 4th and the 5th of July. So it's been about a week and a half, two weeks now when the adults start emerging. So typically what the adult western corn rootworm and northern corn rootworm do, although we're primarily concerned with the western here, when the adults emerge, uh, they start doing a little bit of feeding. If there's no silks or tassels available, they will feed a little bit on the on the green leaf tissue, but primarily they'll start feeding on the silks. As soon as they start uh, finding silks, the adults start feeding on silks and pollen. But the last two weeks, a lot of the emergence has occurred, and a lot of the growers that have continuous corn or a non-rootworm BT corn have called and are seeing corn rootworm beetles feeding on the silks. 
They're also seeing other beetles feed on the silks, and those are the Japanese beetle and the green June beetle. These uh, primarily are in the eastern part of the state, uh, but if you get the western corn rootworm adult and the Japanese beetle and the, and the green June beetle feeding on the silks, they can do a number on them very quickly. The nice thing about it is the silks are very efficient at accepting pollen or collecting pollen. So, you know, a lot of guys are wondering what the treatment threshold is for silk clipping, and that's pretty uh, variable. We've we tried to establish that over the years. There's no real hard and fast number. If you go out and the silks are being clipped off, broomed off to the point that they're hardly sticking out of the husks at all, uh, whether you just don't think they're going to catch any pollen, you might want to consider a treatment for the adults. But it has to be quite severe, that clipping, it sounds. It does because the pollination will occur for four or five days. Now, one of the caveats on, on this is the heat, uh, you know, when we get 95 to 100 degree days, uh, it's not going to pollinate anyway. So the beetles usually don't feed during the heat of the day. That's another thing. If you're out looking, if you're trying to make some counts of beetles in silks, you need to go out early in the morning because once it gets to be about 10 o'clock, most of the silk feeding will cease and the beetles will go down into the collars around the plant or down in the shady part of the field. Uh, and then they'll start feeding again probably around 6 p.m. when it starts to cool down a little more. So if you're out looking during the heat of the day, it may skew your counts a little bit just because the beetles are gone. But you're exactly right. It it has to broom that silk back considerably before you need to think about treating with an insecticide. Most of the insecticides that we've tested over the years for corn rootworm adult control at least work really well. The key is getting enough carrier or enough water so that you can get the insecticide down to the silks because you realize there's a canopy above those silks. So when you spray, and most of the time it will be sprayed by air, and these are contact insecticides, you've got to make sure that insecticide actually contacts the pest, in this case one of the adult rootworms. They're going to feed for three or four or five days. Then they're going to take off and go lay eggs. They generally don't come back to the silks, and by then most of the silks are brown. Once those silks turn brown or senesce far enough along so they're not nice succulent green food for these insects, they will go elsewhere to look for food. So at that point in time, you don't need to worry about the adult rootworm. All right. You say that in growing sorghum, there are certain caterpillars working on the whorls of those plants, Jeff. Yes, and we just talked about corn, and a lot of the corn is at the silking stage. And right now there's a lot of corn earworm larvae and fall army worm larvae in the ears. Um, that's what we generally call a corn earworm. It depends on the species. It doesn't really matter. They do about the same kind of damage. The ones I've seen are pretty small, so they're going to feed about another two weeks. Then they're going to pupate in the soil. And then they're going to come out as an adult, they're going to mate, and then they're probably going to go to sorghum or soybeans. Uh, right now, the sorghum, a lot of the sorghum in central Kansas, at least, is in the whorl stage. And in the whorl stage, we get what we call ragworm damage. It's the same thing, fall armyworm or corn earworm uh, feeding in the whorls of the plants. And as they're down in the world, they take a few bites out of that rolled up leaf. And as it grows out, it looks pretty ragged. Therefore, the name ragworm. And they do. They do cause a lot of concern because it's highly visible. There's also right now in a few places in central Kansas, there are what we call cattail caterpillars. And those are very showy orange, black, and white caterpillars. They don't really get down into the world, but they'll feed on the leaves, especially on the underneath side of the leaf. And they also can rag up the leaves. So if you got rural feeding by corn earworms, fall armyworms, armyworm, whatever, plus cattail caterpillars, they can rag up these plants, the leaves on these plants, pretty good. The nice thing about it, we've done, again, we've done quite a few studies over the years. That damage will grow out and it doesn't impact yield. So we really do not recommend treating for rural stage infestations of caterpillars for two reasons. Number one, you can't get the insecticide down into the whorl where they are. And also, by the time you've noticed it, 
most of the feedings done, the worm that was there is probably ready to crawl down and pupate, so there's not going to be any more ragged feeding or ragged-looking leaves. And number two, it doesn't really impact yield. Uh, The plants are easily able to compensate for this ragged leaf feeding. The cattail caterpillars, they're very showy, bright orange, black, and white. And what we have found in past years, about 90% of those are parasitized. So even if you see a large one out there, probably 90% of them will just die on their own and they're not going to feed anymore. And as a matter of fact, uh, I have reports that some guys are finding carcasses of the of the worms on the leaves already. So the natural control is working on the cattail caterpillars. It doesn't work so well on the corn worms or the fall army worms down in the whirl. But our recommendation really is just don't treat, just accept that ragged-looking damage, but it will not impact the yield or the health of the plant. It just looks bad. All right. And briefly here, one further pest that you bring to our attention. In grain sorghum, as well as soybeans, false chinch bugs. I have gotten calls about false chinch bugs. And every year we get calls about false chinch bugs and burrowing bugs about the same time when the growers spray their weeds and their soybeans uh, because the natural food source is weeds of both burrowing bugs and false chinch bugs. This year I've gotten several calls about false chinch bugs causing considerably more damage than usual. Usually I get calls and there'll be a patch of them in the thousands of these false chinch bugs. The difference, they, they're a little smaller than a chinch bug. They're a little, the adult doesn't have the white X on its back. It's just mostly white. The immatures or nymphs are mostly tan or brown, whereas the the nymph of a chinch bug will be gray or reddish color, depending upon the developmental stage. The false chinch bug, I've never seen them do damage, but this year I've seen pictures sent in by growers uh, and consultants and county agents where they have done damage on soybeans. Actually, we're in enough abundance, they suck the juice out of the plants to kill soybean plants in small patches. So just be aware, if you're spraying your soybeans, if your soybeans are at that point where you're spraying Roundup to kill the weeds, you may have a buildup of burrowing bugs, which kind of look like stink bugs, or these false chinch bugs. And and if they actually are causing damage, the false chinch bug is only going to be there for four or five days. They're going to disperse. They're going to go look for weeds, generally in the mustard family. But while they're there, they may feed a little bit, and they may do a little damage. But I've never seen it prior to this year that we would have to treat it. But this year, uh, like I said, some of the some of the growers, especially in southeast Kansas, have been having some problems with false chinch bugs. So just a note, if you have them, if they're, if they're field-wide or if they're in more than just one small patch, you may have to consider treatment. But I really think if you just wait three or four days, they will disperse, move out, and you won't have a problem with them. No lack of insects in our row crops out there, and we will have you back in a few days, Jeff, for there's still more you're hearing about on that score. And until then, appreciate your time right here. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. That's a report on uh, several of those insects putting pressure on our corn, grain sorghum, and soybean crops out there, and whether that warrants a response from you growers. That's Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist at K-State, and you're listening to agriculture today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus. So if you have a fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going in. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson back with you and with today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. This week's Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report, out from Kansas Agricultural Statistics for the week ending this past Sunday, reads like this. Our topsoil moisture supplies, 4% surplus, 57% adequate, 39%, short to very short. Subsoil moisture then, 2% surplus, 58% adequate, and 40% short to very short, again, as of this past weekend. The condition of the Kansas corn crop this week, 54% good to 
to excellent, 32% fair, 14% poor to very poor. Corn now silking at 66%. That's near the average. And in the dough stage, 25%. In the dent, at 1%. Soybean crop condition, 57% good to excellent, 34% fair, and 9% poor to very poor. Soybeans now blooming, 55%, and setting pods at 15%. Grain sorghum, 55% good to excellent, 36% fair, 9% poor to very poor. Sorghum headed now at 15%, and sorghum turning color is at 1%. And range and pasture conditions around Kansas this week, 38% good to excellent, 38% fair, and 24% poor to very poor, according to the USDA. Now, there's not much change in condition ratings for the nation's corn and soybeans, as we hear from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey has the latest outlook for corn and soybeans. Parts of the Midwest received quite a bit of rain during the week, but some eastern production areas still came up short. If you put it all together, not a whole lot of change in corn and soybean conditions. First, he has the corn condition numbers. No change in the national numbers. Steady at 69% good to excellent, 8% very poor to poor. Of course, this year's crop looking better than what we saw this time a year ago. Corn silking and corn doughing are both ahead of average. Meanwhile, with soybean condition... Not much overall change. We actually saw just a slight uptick in overall condition. 69% good to excellent. 7% very poor to poor. The only change is a one-point increase in the good to excellent ratings over last week. The pace of soybeans blooming and setting pods are both ahead of average. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Also in the headlines today, BASF and Corteva AgriScience are now contesting the results of that June 3rd decision by three judges on the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, which vacated the registrations of their dicamba herbicides, Ingenia and Fexapan, as well as Bayer's Extendamax herbicide. Last evening, the two companies filed separate petitions asking for an in-bank review of that case. Next up, this week's edition of Milk Lines with K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I want to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning the multitude of silage inoculants that we have available to us as we approach the corn silage season. I know many of you have probably made decisions on inoculants for your silages already, and some are probably still trying to make those decisions. And There's a few things that you might want to consider as you look at the various choices. Obviously, there's a wide range of prices as it looks based on the benefits that you get from some of these different inoculants and what kind of technologies might be contained in those. Some of these silage inoculants are very cheap, maybe only 25 cents per ton of silage, up to maybe $1.20 to $1.50 a ton, depending on, again, what types of technologies are included in those inoculants. So your basic silage inoculant is simply a lactobacillus type bacteria inoculant that's going to increase the amount of lactic acid and the rate of fermentation in that silage as you start the fermentation process. Those are the ones that are going to be on the cheaper end. Uh, As they go up in price, they generally contain very specific types of bacteria rather than just general lactobacillus bacteria, and that is the reason for the increased cost. Those that contain specific strains are those that have been found to work better with corn silage or other silage crops than just the general lactobacillus bacteria. So again, these can be very specific and can give you a faster increase in the amount of lactic acid in your silage, which will lower the pH of that silage much quicker. So you get a quicker fermentation process with these. Now as you move on up the line, there are different inoculants that contain different types of bacteria. Some of those bacteria that we utilize, such as l will actually increase the aerobic stability of the silage at feed out. So if you have a silage that you know you're going to be feeding during the summertime when it's warmer, you might want to choose an inoculant that contains the lactobacillus butyneri strains. These will generally have less problems with heating in the bunk during the summer than those that did not contain it. There's some other things that we sometimes consider as well. There are some bacteria that are better at 
fighting funguses, and others are oxygen scavengers. Oxygen scavengers are probably part of the most expensive type of silo treatments that we can purchase. Those may contain special types of lactobacillus bacteria that are oxygen scavenging, or they may also contain some chemicals such as sodium benzoate, which also helps reduce the oxygen level in the silage mass quicker, which results in quicker fermentation and better preservation. So, as you look at your choices, you might be looking at a bill that's between 90 cents and maybe $1.20 per ton. So how are you going to pay for that? Well, keep in mind, there's three, I think, important things. First, if we have a well-preserved silage, it's going to be more consistent in our feeding ration. Keep in mind that most of your diets are going to be 25 to 35 percent silage on a dry matter basis. So it's a very, very important part of the diet that we feed to our dairy cows. Secondly, you will increase the amount of dry matter recovery if you use good inoculants. You will generally increase your recovery by 2 to 3 percent. This is pretty significant when we look at how we're going to pay for this. And then the final thing to consider is that milk production, based on research, will increase anywhere from 3 to 5 percent. This is about 2.5 to uh, maybe 4 pounds of milk on an 85-pound herd. So that 90 cents to maybe $1.20 a ton that you're going to pay for silage inoculants, Again, you can quickly pay for that with this increased milk production. Even though we have a uh, cheaper milk price than maybe what we would like, it's still a very important thing that we should do to manage our dairy herd and improve our production over the next year. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to make very careful decisions concerning silage inoculants as we go into corn silage harvest. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, our weekly visit with Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Charlie, you still get questions, you say, from pond owners about leaking farm ponds. It's a frequent occurrence. And the obvious question, why those ponds leak? And you have some thoughts on the likely prospects of that. Yes. Here in Kansas, we're blessed with lots of ponds. The most common causes of pond leakage include improper pond construction, permeable soils or layers that have high sand or gravel, or thin layers of soil over the top of fractured rock in the pond bottom. I get lots of questions about ponds, and people are looking for a cheap, easy, quick fix. But the keys to properly uh, repairing those leaky ponds uh, is properly identifying the cause of the seepage and then selecting an appropriate method of sealing the pond. And... In my experience over the last about 30 years of helping folks deal with leaky ponds is that there are no cheap, easy fixes, or there are very few that are successful. I want to get into those, but coming back to one of the main reasons for a farm pond leak, or outright failure for that matter, improper construction, how so, typically? Well, I usually start by asking a series of questions, and the first one is, was the site properly was the vegetation and trees removed and the topsoil? Was there a proper core trench put into the dam or the embankment? And then was that pond dam or levees around the side built properly in compacted layers or lifts of about six inches or less? Was the sides and the pond bottom adequately compacted? Is the area known for having high sand content? How deep is the soil? What's the percentage of clay in the soil? And then is there fractured rock there somewhere, either on the sides or just under the pond bottom? 
it's best if you can ask those questions directly to the person that built the pond. But consider some of these ponds in Kansas may have been built at least 50 to 75 years ago. Those people that did the original construction are probably no longer around. So folks are often better off just starting over and finding a new site that you've done some proper research. The soil conditions are correct. The watershed is appropriately sized and then reconstruct the pond. Every site that might have what you may think would be a good pond location may not be suitable in holding water. In Kansas, in the Flint Hills, there's a lot of fractured rock. The further west you go, perhaps uh, the watersheds may not be large enough. In some areas of the western part of Kansas, the caliche soils uh, just don't seem to hold. And then in southwest Kansas, it's just very sandy in some locations, and a lot of ponds are just don't have suitable soils to hold adequately. If, though, starting anew with a farm pond isn't practical for an individual, is there any way of repairing an existing pond that has any measure of potential success? Yes, I think you, one of the things you can do is start with compaction. I typically don't suggest trying to repair a leaky pond with water still in the pond. The attempts to repair those through the water column just simply have a high degree of failure. But if you can drain the pond or get pump the water out, siphon the water out, compaction may be something that can show good results. If not, you may be able to put a clay blanket over the pond bottom. Sometimes if you can identify just the uh, spot where the leak is occurring, you may not have to do the entire pond bottom. And there has been some success of using the water dyes to help you localize where the pond may be leaking. If you can just treat a spot, the cost goes way down. If you have to treat the entire basin with a new clay blanket, the cost certainly goes up. Bentonite is commonly suggested as a treatment. It's certainly a good option. It's pricey, but it works best when it's done on a pond that's drained and the bentonite is incorporated into the bottom one to two feet of the pond bottom and then compacted in. Simply trying to sprinkle bentonite on the top of the surface of a leaky pond does not seem to be very effective. There are people that have had some success. It usually takes lots of bentonite in order to get it to drop down into the right location. When you're putting a very small particle, which bentonite is clay particles that are very tiny, when you put that on the water surface and expect it to drop straight down, the bentonite often end up in locations other than where it needs to be. How about pond liners then? Do they work There are pond liners that work, need to be properly prepared. They're perhaps even more expensive than bentonite treatments. If you're in an area that has spring that's feeding your pond, sometimes when you have water inflow from underneath the liner, it causes the liner to bubble up to the surface. So it's not a panacea for all leaky ponds, but there are some locations where that certainly works. It seems to work better in real sandy soils than some of the other locations. You have to make sure that there's the, the pond bottom is properly prepared so you don't tear or damage the vinyl or rubber liner. And then the last one would be dispersants. Those are things like salt or soda ash or some of the polymer products that are out there that, uh, again, are promoted to cause the clay particles to to sink and uh, flock together so that you get a good seal. If you have a leaky pond somewhere in the process, talk to NRCS folks or soil scientists, get some information from them about your existing soil, and then do a thorough job of research before you select one of these options because they're all going to be fairly pricey. That comes back to the final point. You may be money ahead by starting over with that pond. 
Charlie, we appreciate the word on contending with leaking farm ponds. Charlie Lee, wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Well, our time's away once again. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.